As usual, another great guest, but a quick diversion. You'll notice that our full name is the Marketplace for Health, Wealth, and Freedom. Well, let's talk about your health for a moment. If you'd like to escape from the stranglehold of insurance and be able to see alternative doctors or go across state lines for care, then you definitely need to take a look at patientempowerment.mpb.health and see if that's the fix you've been looking for. Now, let's get back to the show. Welcome, folks, to Freedom Hub. We have a great uh, collection of leaders in markets and advocacy uh, in the list here. And uh, Jim is my co-host, Jim Greatpack. Jeff Cantor is the old co-host who still is recovering in Cleveland, helping us upload these recordings onto YouTube uh, and, and also Rumble and BitChute and Brighton, which we have to use because, um, you know, Jim and I like to push the envelope. Um, yeah, which makes us appreciative of mainstreamers like Michael and others, Mark Scowls and a couple of weeks ago coming onto our show, because, um, you know, we're going to, um, you know, push the envelope and make some folks uncomfortable. And sometimes YouTube doesn't like that. And they've banned a couple of our recent <laughs> recordings. So we have to share the recordings on Rumble uh, because of that. Um, I, you know, I like Americans for Prosperity. When I was at the Cato Institute a couple of decades ago, um, you know, there wasn't really any real big money in, in free market health reform. I remember as a Republican staffer in the early 90s, part of this rump group of health savings account advocates to fight Hillary Care. You know, Pat Rooney at Golden Rule Insurance Company funded the free market organization to really push consumer based reform. Heritage was on that bandwagon too, and a few others. Um, but it's nice to have some bigger money behind free market reform now. And that's what Americans for, for Prosperity is. Uh, they're really focused on the states. In my experience, uh, I've had Ben Knotts present here a year ago on their uh, efforts to expand telemedicine, which really exploded during COVID, and also to open up the supply um, around hospitals with certificate of need repeal. That's a, that's a critical reform so physicians can get their hand in on how to run hospitals um, rendered even more important as so many COVID patients have suffered malpractice in the hospitals around COVID. Uh, you know, this is psychotic, but the standards of care for COVID have really uh, suppressed er, um, early treatment of off-label drugs that actually work like ivermectin and instead have pushed uh, dangerous drugs like remdesivir, uh, intubation, and you know that's been a big cause of the deaths uh, over the past uh, couple of years. So uh, repealing the hospital monopoly uh, on hospitals, it's called con repeal, is an important uh, reform. Uh, Michael says he met me during the Gary Johnson campaign, uh, which I helped run in over the last two cycles. Uh, he was a young college advocate, which is great because you know Murray, I wasn't that you know, politically active during college at William and Mary. I was just trying to get out in four years. Uh, I became a libertarian working as a Republican in the '90s, and a, and a big, a big libertarian. Uh, eventually, um, the personal option that he's going to present today is really great because AFP is smart. They use polling to figure out what's going to work so that their money people know that they're going to get a bang for their buck. And the reason I say that is because the pollster showed that the personal option had backing even from Democrats, uh, which is incredible. And if you look at the old Democrat um, counter, uh, the public option, uh, single payer, uh, Medicare for all, they actually passed that in Vermont. And not a lot of folks know this, but when they realized they had to pay for it with higher taxes, <laughs> they, they changed their mind which is unbelievable. Think of a, a communist state like Vermont passing single pair and then change the, their mind just because they had to pay for it. Um, but the personal option also I like because it's, it's vague enough where advocates and entre entrepreneurs who are in this space of creating the market, and I consider myself in this space since Forbes featured our sharing combo with health savings accounts, and I work with cash appointment uh, um, entrepreneurs like Dean Jargo, who also is an alum of the Coke uh, Industries uh, conglomerate. Um, you know, it's, it's a plan that's gonna allow for the best in America 
to add their expertise. And that's why I really wanted people in the invitation to ask tough questions, because uh, there will be a limit how far the personal option efforts will go. Um, you know, there will be health freedom advocates who, who, be, who will be disappointed that they won't be as aggressive on a more political health freedom aspects or the integrated revolution that a lot of friends of, of mine are involved with. Um, but, you know, healthcare is a cartel, a sense of the economy, and you have to start somewhere. Uh, so with that, Michael, why don't you go ahead and take over and yeah. tell us about the personal option and why folks should get behind it as probably the best chance to reform the cartel. Yeah, absolutely. So we kind of talked about like for many, many conservatives inside like the free market, like, um, you know, kind of world, we when asked about like what we know what you guys are against, but what are you guys for? And there's a lot of things that we were able, able to say, you know, we could talk about like, hey, like we need to expand HSAs. You know, we want to be able to reform, the, offer more association of health plans, catastrophic care, uh, direct pr pr primary care, health, health sharing, um, expanding more telemedicine access, COPN. And we start listing a long, a long list, uh, selling a list of different initiatives, sounding like that, you know, we're like some like an, an encyclopedia. And the healthcare is kind of being able to message that to voters has been one of the key issues of kind of like messaging, what are we really for? And so like when you take um, like uh, polling that's been done in Virginia by like a couple other, um, by like C CNU and also uh, on top level Pew re research polling, you find that like the majority of like that one, healthcare has been one of the top issues for the past like two decades. Uh, which even this research po uh, polling has like healthcare costs is right underneath strengthening the uh, national economy. Um, but then, but then like when you break down to what voters really care about, like how do, you, do they perceive the two plans? Democrats support like widely at least some some form of a public option, while Republicans are like and support like some un, um, unambiguous plan or just some form of plan that could get out there. And so it's really been a key messaging problem of being able to resonate uh, an alternative plan uh, that really that can work for uh, that can actually work. And so that's kind of the hidden secret out there. When people kind of ask, what are reforms that we could do for healthcare? There's quite a lot of good ideas, but we need to be able to synthesize it. So that's what personal option campaign is kind of about. It's one. Uh, a targeted list of sensible reforms to address the barriers um, that are impacting individuals to be able to get their own uh, access to care and being able to alleviate and improve more access uh, and also improving on the getting access onto the demand side. Um, and then two, it's, uh, well, and the one, the reason for that is because instead of we're talking about fixing the healthcare system is kind of the, the entire, entire gap in which we should be redesigning a healthcare system around the individual, because the larger problem is about, um, well, healthcare costs are too high. Well, then what's, how do you price fix, or you, uh, what an adequate price would look like? Secret is, is, you can't, is you can't do that. So the market is the word, where it provides the cost, the um, actual price controls, and uh, individuals in the market have the best ability to do so. Um, so being able to uh, resonate with that and redesign it around the individual and address the policy initiatives that do uh, give greater access to individuals and to that have greater control and choice over their own healthcare coverage uh, starts creating those good reforms inside the, mar the healthcare system that starts bringing costs down. And then two, it's simplistic. Uh, the personal option, healthcare is inherently personal. It's individualized, it's, it's a human experience. People go through many different things. And so being able to, there needs to be something that's to be an alternative to talk about. So instead of talking about like, hey, we're, this is Medicare for all, like for a public option, well, what do you support? Be able to refer to saying, I support a personal option. What does that mean? Well, it's being able to increase the, uh, talk about the right, right policies, to talk about giving more, more, more choice. And so there's about 10 policy initiatives we've really identified as four that could be able to increase supply and then four that increase demand. Um, 
And yeah, I think, and what those, uh, sorry, I need to move my zoom over here. And so kind of what those reforms uh, look like is one, being able to expand uh, health sa savings accounts. Uh, being able to, every individual should be able to have access to an account uh, for, to be able to put away, uh, set aside money that's tax-free um, and that they're able to keep with them. The fact that health insurance has not been able to be, be portable, I mean, like, is been, um, uh, and, and has uh, drastically inhibit the marketplace. And the fact that health insurance just really doesn't work like actual insurance, uh, people treat healthcare already like prepaid healthcare. And so being able to, a uh, one, like that's not like super new for many conservative, uh, conservatives inside the free market world. Um, but, uh, being able to, it's, uh, but being able to reframe the way we talk about HSAs, direct pr pr primary care, telemedicine, telehealth, COPN, um, is a very important way to synthesize it to a voter. Because at the end of the day, you have about like 10 seconds to kind of get your message across. You need, and already like we know people's the memories and all that issues really don't stick unless you more something to be more more catchy and that's what the personal option is able to really kind of identify as much more positive messaging a way to resonate with into, with us voters that is really kind of connected to them and which we've seen over the over the corona uh during the pandemic and which there's been a larger share of american voters that are actually now much more supportive of believing that their healthcare should be something that works better for them and something that they should be able to have more personal access to. Um, so, so then kind of want to go into why personal option a little bit. And then I think kind of, uh, there's probably some more back and forth, uh, Charles, um, to look for. So, yeah, some some key facts and figures that we found with some of our polling about on personal option is one we found that seven out of ten voters prefer a personal option for plan versus a Medicare for all. Um, that uh, fifty three percent of voters really support uh, or wanting to keep what works and fix what's broken, and even like a higher number, about eighty percent, wants it is uh, wants to be able to see a healthcare plan that uh, isn't a drastic overhaul of the entire system. But one that's very, very, very targeted and fixing the things that actually work. And there's things in the U.S. healthcare system that does work. Uh, one, we are the leading in, in innovation. Um, and for every other like country in the world, like the hidden secret to to the U.S. healthcare system is that um, they get the innovations that have been done in medical care in the U.S. at a bargain. And many of these single payer system countries would not be able to even afford or often create many of the research-based innovations done in the US. And so being able to have a top-down senior payer approach, one, takes away that innovation and being able, able to expand much more portable options and give more individuals choice and control, you start being able to have better market signals of where that innovation can go. Um, and then being able to, there's broader consensus of where the US electoral mindset is, is that three-fourths of voters want to choose the healthcare coverage that's right for them um, 69% of voters don't want more government control on their healthcare. And then 58% of voters believe that personal option would make them and their families better off. And knowing that like health, you know, it probably would be fitting that's for healthcare in which individuals, you know, for when you have like a cr chronic conditions and you go through, you know, when, when you go through an illness, you often don't have one thing that needs fixing. There's often many things you need to have fixed. Well, there's about 12 things that is rising healthcare costs. There's not uh, certainly a single bu a silver bullet out there that's going to like address it. Um, and Medicare for all, like it passes inside the U.S. or a single payer system would not fix, would, one, wouldn't fix anything that's uh, currently the issues, the driving healthcare costs in the U.S. and rations the care that people are able to get now and makes things worse off. And so by being able to connect to voters, that there should be a personal option for their healthcare. They should be able, they can get access to, uh, and they should be able to have access to an account and HSAs uh, for, for all, um, that the uh, reforms in COPN, telemedicine, be able to communicate these type of reforms and how it makes a better personalized experience 
for them at getting their healthcare. So um, great. And so that's why I believe in the personal option and why I believe if you, when you talk about reforming healthcare, when you really be able to talk about the reforms needed to communicate uh, where, where do, what does like our side support? Well, we would support a personal option that people could be able to go on the marketplace, be able to have real prices and real price tra transparency, and then be able to choose what works best for them. You know, are you, do you support like, uh, does cash off the care make the most sense for you? Or like it's, um, you know, or if you choose to put much, or if you are more concerned about your fam the needs of your, of your family, be able to put more into an HSA every year, um, or what does short-term plans work for you? You know, it, there's not, central, central planning has been the issue and being able to actually address the barriers to give more individuals real decisions improves those market signals. And so yeah, that is the synthesis of the personal option. Our website is personaloption.com. Uh, love for you guys to be able to, to check it out. And I have quite more, more to say, but uh, now um, we'd love to hear some questions and some feedback. Indeed, Michael and folks in the chat, I invited everyone to click the raise hand icon, which uh, one should be able to find around the Zoom controls area where you see mute, stop video, participants, or reactions. It's under the reactions tab on my laptop. Um, so I'll start the questioning until others want to raise their hand. Um, so there's a couple of recommended corrections that I would suggest for Americans for, for Prosperity. Um, three I noticed on your website. Uh, I'll start with um, insurance options and Murray might add to this, Professor Sabrin. Uh, you want all insurance options, you know, which, which is fine. It's a state-based cartel uh, because of antitrust exemptions and the inability to cross state lines. But, uh, you know, the insurance companies got in bed with government a long time ago, um, first with uh, Medicare Advantage and now with Obamacare. In Medicare Advantage, a lot of people are getting more coverage through managed care um, privatized Medicare, which is which is good and, and also bad in some ways, similar to Obamacare. Uh, Biden expanded subsidies for premiums on the state exchanges, which is nice for upper middle class families, but the deductible still are six grand on average. And the problem with insurance in general, whether for families or for retirees, are the networks they use to uh, exclude the best doctors that you'll want if you do get cancer or heart attacks. So a million good, mostly conservative, small business types abandoned insurance over the past decade for what's called uh, medical cost sharing, uh, which full disclosure, I sell and got featured in Forbes. And the reason they never go back to insurance is because, well, it's cheaper, it's half the cost. But you know, the reason I push it is because there's no networks, you can go wherever you want. And so I would change that phrase, more insurance options to more health plan options. And I think George Klassen probably would back that because uh, what he is doing along with his other, other what are called Rosetta type advisors is um, educating CFOs uh, to get off the BUCAS, uh, which is an acronym for Blue Cross United Signet Aetna and Humana. Uh, which who are ripping off the big Fortune 500 companies. And what George and his experts do on LinkedIn every day is talk about direct contracting, uh, data combing, um, and you know, creating a local group of providers that can give the, provide, give the employer a better price and a better experience. Um, so you know, I wonder, I'll stop there, Michael. Do you have any thoughts on uh, um, expanding the phrase? Yeah, uh, I, that's a good, good uh, flag. Um, I, I agree with you. Uh, that's it, but better is to say health plan options. Um, initially, I thought you were about to say like, we should not support like uh, increasing insurance in general. Like, no, we just think a market that people should be able to kind of choose what, what works best for them. But yeah, right. health, health plan options is, 
I'll make a note, note of that. Yeah. George and Murray, do you yeah. have any comment on that uh, suggestion? Yeah, but I'll, I'll, I'll speak for hours and hours. But um, yeah, look, um, I, I'm, I'm in total agreement that free mar the free market is the best. Let's just let the free market sort it out. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just a pity that the politicians can't get out of the way. Because every time a good idea gets traction, Blue Cross goes crying to their lobbyists um, and they say, well, mm, these people are cherry picking healthy people out of our pool. So stop that, you know, stop the health sharing in that state or states throw in the, the individual mandate, which is thievery in my opinion. Um, but but they'll, they'll, they'll make it really difficult for personal choices for people to be able to say, well, this works better for me and my family. This is what I'm going to do. I mean, I, my, I'm, an, I'm a good example of it. Nobody ever asked the insurance guy, what do you do for a living, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 it, it, it shocks me that you, you, you said I educate CFOs. CFOs already think they know everything. So <laughs> it, it's hard to educate them. They, 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 when I walk into a boardroom or whatever, they, they all think that they have an insurance problem and they want the broker of the week to come in and sell them the latest shiny thing and fix their insurance problem by selling them more insurance. But the fact is that the problem that they have is the way that their employees access healthcare and the way they finance to pay for that healthcare. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. Now, if people have more choices, if you cut out middlemen and you go direct to providers, you, uh, you, uh, you, you, then you can, you can actually focus on quality. When you, when, you, when you focus on quality, you lower costs. It's win-win. You have happier doctors who do what they love to do and they don't have to spend doing so much paperwork. They get paid faster and better than any buca pays them. Mm -hmm. But to, to bring this whole complex idea across to somebody who thinks he's going to fit you in in a 45-minute meeting to try to check a box for one of the problems he has to solve at his company, it, 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 the results, you know, that's why we sit with this massive, massive problem right now. It's a... There's a lot of good ideas out there, very slow adoption. Yeah, honestly. And like, if we're honest, like there's probably gonna be like one or two times of real legislation that we might be able to get past on the national level. When you take the political environments, like um, when you, it's just like the, the trending, like the, the direction, like uh, Medicare for all is slowly building it's more and more support. And the more that there's just not like a, a real plan out there, uh, it's gonna get worse. And um, and we just keep like, increasing that riskier like uh, uh, chance that it's gonna pass like within like the next decade or is something similar or is something to be to be done. And if if something's gonna pass, then or if we're gonna need if the voters gonna want to see something done, then let's do it on our terms. You know, let's be be the ones to communicate. Let's build that support. Let's you know, the obstacle is the way that if voters are concerned about, about healthcare and if, the, if there's been a lack of messaging, then let's focus on being able to improve that messaging to voters and start shaping consensus and changing public opinion. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I um, agree. You see, the, the, the problem is, sorry, Charles, um, most people in America think health insurance is healthcare. That's yeah. the big problem. See, mm -hmm. That's why they get stuck on Medicare for all, because what these people really want, they don't, they don't know what Medicare is or how it works. They just think it's a buzzword to say, we're not going to get ripped off around every corner anymore in the, 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 the Cigna price tags and the Blue Cross price tags that's on every service. So, so, so they want a more affordable solution. That's what I hear when people say, what about Medicare for all? Because the prices are fixed. It's mm -hmm. a good reference point. You know, and there's a lot of providers who would do business all day long for Medicare plus a little bit extra. And it, it's hundreds of percent. Well, OK, my math it, to pay that compared to a Blue Cross price tag, you're you're paying a, a lot more. Sometimes it's, it's several hundred percent more compared to what the Medicare rates are. Um, and and that, that's really the, the thing is, it's unaffordable. My I have a family. In my state of Maine, an Anthem plan would cost me about $2,000 a month, right? That's nuts. Now, on top of that, they give you a $15,000 financial exposure. 
That, that is, if anybody ends up in a hospital, because anything that's expensive has coinsurance, 30% coinsurance on it, you're going to write a $15,000 check or they're going to collect on you. Um, the, and the, the hospitals here own the collection agencies now. And this is happening in every state. So, so, so I, I'm not paying Anthem. I, I have a health sharing and I have direct primary care. And the whole thing costs me less than 700 bucks a month. It's 600 and a little bit of change. That's a good deal for my family. And if anything happens to anybody, the, most, the, the biggest financial exposure we have is $2,500 for the event. Even if it takes three, four, 10 years to cure it or to treat it, we're fine. You see, that, that's a personal choice. That's what I do. As, I'm the insurance guy and I don't buy insurance for myself and my family. Yeah, a lot of my customers are the highest level advisors like you, George. Um, like I'm thinking of... Um, a couple of guys that do exactly what you do and yeah it's just, it's it's kind of foolish <laughs> right because they know the game's rigged they know it's a scam yeah, yeah. Let, let's let's um continue if, if folks want to come on that feel free but another polling data point michael and joe i'll uh, get to you next um in your screen share michael was the fear people have because of what george just described which is the unaffordable unaffordability uh, mm -hmm. risk, which is high because I think two thirds of families who declare bankruptcy actually had insurance. Um, yeah. And, and it, it is triggered by the coinsurance that George mentioned in the hospital and also the surprise billing because of the networks that insurance companies use, which leads to doctors in your hospital operating room not being in network. Um, and a few alternatives that you do include in your personal option would help that with that. And George can comment. He just mentioned uh, DPC, direct primary care, um, to help with the unaffordability, uh, big bill problem. Um, you know, I'm not sure if Dean Jargo made it to the call, but there's some vendors that George and I know that are trying to disgorge from the specialist uh, a bundle price, which is slow going, but it's it's killer when you can get it done with the specialist uh, uh, charge, the anesthesiologist charge and the facility charge, um, but also not just sharing, George knows about this, the health matching account. We, we all know about the health savings account, which is great for out of pocket. Uh, when I sell it to people like George, I tell them not to use it, uh, to actually use it as a tax shelter to build a hundred grand for retirement. So you can use it for out of pocket, long-term care, Medicare gaps or a vacation home. Um, the money doubling health matching account is better for a current out of pocket and for that coinsurance because it cuts all the out of pocket in half. Um, do you have any comments on the? I mean, those are just market innovation, so that follows your your yeah documents pretty well. <laughs> yeah, um, um, we we definitely or we we don't have, have uh, you know innovations will keep coming out and there'll be new uh, new and better ways to be able to keep be able to provide more care. So like, that's kind of what we're, we're expecting is not that this will be the all encompassing kind of like every single one, one of these plans that on, only these things and pass the hopefully pass like a legislation and then it's it like no there will be continuing to be more things out there that the market provides of smarter ways to be able to um, uh, provide better care and keep innovating so one be able to support like health, health, health matching is uh something that we we would support um and being able to uh what you ju ju just talked about being able to talk more um something that we we would support and uh we're are expecting that there's be uh, things out there in the future that will be we could be able to keep adding on to the personal option like cam campaign and expecting like that once you know if we can get uh one day a bill to pass through through congress be able to address these key, key reforms needed, then to still be able to message on personal option about continual improvements that will continue to be, be necessary in states and, and in Congress. Um, okay, Joe, you wanna uh, raise your hand and then Murray, I think you're on deck. Yeah, Michael, I, I love like the, the concept of what you say Mm -hmm. um, and the different points that you bring out. Um, at the same time, the way that you talk about legislation 
and the insurance companies versus talking about the stuff that Charles talked about, you know, whether it's the medical cost sharing communities that exist or now the, you know, different websites that have popped up where you can just type in what type of procedure you're looking for and you can find out what that cash price is. So mm -hmm. the way that like I view the website and the stuff that's being shared is you're you're saying all the sexy points, but you're still promoting like a government backed, you know, we're going to, we want this in place and we're going to put mm -hmm. these laws there for you. And while laws are kind of, you know, the necessary evil, so to speak, you know, the way that I would like to see is where you're like, you're removing, you know, the hoops that people have to jump through and like, that to me on your website isn't portrayed like you're not saying hey this is an issue with existing law and if we remove it it's going to make insurance better for personal options you know to me it's like you're fighting for legislation for personal options that already exist if people are awoke to medical cost sharing and health matching accounts and you know dpcs and the other websites where you can just go find whatever doctor you want and pay the cash price that you're looking for um because all the all the options for personal options exist they're already out there the, like george kind of alluded to it's just crazy that businesses think that they have to perform their own like we'll use our own group because we're a big corporation versus just taking that big corporation and moving them in into a medical cost sharing program that already exists, mm -hmm. right? right? So yeah, so, so it's just it's like yeah. I'm totally behind what you're doing, but at the yeah. same time, I'm like, are you sure you're really doing it right by trying to like go after a personal options law? Am right. I missing something? And yeah. By so, the way, um, Michael. By uh, the way, um, Joe is a marketer, so feel free to message him after the fact to brainstorm <laughs> on that topic because that's he's always going to nitpick. Um, yeah, because he's Absolutely. he wants he wants us to win. I appreciate that. Um, I I'm same same boat. Uh, so do we? So what what you said about removing the actual like laws? Um, that actually is kind of the what what we do support, and uh, we kind of so I uh, noticing I, our website just kind of came, came out um a couple like weeks ago, and you're right. Like the one place that we kind of we put uh when we kind of go through our policy agenda, say that personal option rests on two key pillars. One, remove barriers between patients and medical and medical professions that they trust, professionals that they trust, and two, empower patients to shop for value as true consumers. So like, you're, you are right that like, when we're kind of talking about telemedicine, telehealth, uh, HSAs, we're talking about how we can remove barriers. Um, uh, like predominantly for HSAs, like, um, it's only paired with employer sponsored health, health, health plans, uh, which you only can get when you choose a high deductible plan. And that's, we think that removing that's not true. That's not true uh, though. Cause you can get an HSA with a medical cost sharing plan, but and yeah, a medical cost sharing plan. Joe, uh, just, a, and, Joe, just right. intersect. Uh, you can't, uh, it has to be combined with, uh, an, ins an insurance plan or health, pl health payment plan with the correct deductible. And uh, we embed that within the package. Uh, so you can't get an HSA with a sharing plan. Uh, so Mike's point is, is, is generally widely known that uh, it, the HSA is hamstrung by requiring it to be combined with a plan period. Uh, so Senator Paul has a bill to uh, allow HSAs to fly free and alone. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to say something because I did a lot of work with HSAs um, mm -hmm. out there in the field, you know, in the real world. The reason employers have started to offer HSIs is because of cost shifting, because they have to take on more risk. So uh, higher deductibles and out of pockets for employees to lower the premium, right? So, so they say, oh, wow, okay, we can check all these boxes and feel good about ourselves. We just say, well, we're going to give you some money. Um, and, and then you can add a little bit more out of your paycheck to the HSI. You can build up this nest egg in a tax shelter, blah, blah, blah. Not a bad idea if you're a high income earner, but if you're supporting a family on fifty to hundred thousand dollars a year, it's gonna hurt to put say to max out the seven thousand a year. 
I'll, I'll tell you, most employers who have employees in that pro in that income range give 500 bucks a year for an individual and a thousand for a family to the HSA. And then they say to the employees, but you can contribute more and they don't because it's too much of a burden. It's already too, they're, they're already not making enough money to pay for life as it is. Uh, the healthcare expenses are high, but here's the big problem I have. Um, and Charles is right. If you have an HSA, don't spend the money. Just, just let it sit there. But most people are forced to. Um, and I've had HSAs, et cetera. The, the, the big problem is that in our fee-for-service environment with no transparency, I don't care how much money has an HSA. That could all be plundered with a couple of medical visits to a doctor, a specialist, and a couple of tests. Next thing you know, boom, that's all gone. It's all wiped out. So, so it's really... You're, you're, you're trying to, um, I mean, you're swimming against a very, very strong tide. So, so, so for the people this is supposed to help in, pra in, in practicality, mm -hmm. it doesn't do much good out there. It's for high income earners that, that, that HSIs are a beautiful thing. George, if I can um, comment on that true statement, um, you know, HSAs, are not the best fit for a lot of blue collar workers who just can't fund them. And, and shop. So, you know, with our Forbes featured combo of HSAs with sharing, we've had to invest a lot with our concierge to do the shopping for them. And while it is a tax shelter for those who can use them, um, have you given much thought? And I know Rosetta type advisors are hiring DPC to try and triage and cut expenses and direct folks correctly. Um, have you given much thought to the money doubling health matching account as a more appropriate vehicle for the out-of-pocket? Because it builds faster than an HSA. It's, re it's a required payment. So for example, you have five grand out-of-pocket, you pay 84 a month over three years, you double what you put in to it now is five grand. Um, so if you do use it for out-of-pocket, it's gonna build rebuild faster. Um, that's So John Goodman at, uh, at Forbes, called it the best supplement for Medicare. And it is because it's a cash-based supplement for those who do have out-of-pocket. It's really a more appropriate vehicle for out-of-pocket. And then you still have to fix what you described, uh, which is the shocking payments in this opaque system. And that's where Michael's AFP uh, alumni, Dean Jargo comes in and Savos comes in as well. They're working with some sharing companies and a, a lot of companies to get that bundled price in advance to kind of deal with that back end problem, uh, you know, which is the surprise cost, which take away all your HSA money. Any thoughts on those DPC HMA, the bundled price effort? Are you talking to me? Yeah, well, for what you're doing. Yeah, like, well, oh, that's me. great. Cause uh, as I said earlier, nobody ever asked the insurance guy what he does. Let me share my screen here quickly. Um, just want to show you guys something. Look, that's my HMA account. I've got 5,000 bucks in there, you know? Like, th that's honestly, like, we love that. And, and, and we spend money in there. We, so um, it, it, I think for somebody that, that, that's not earning a lot of money, who wants to actually have a little nest egg, the HMA is my go-to um, solution, but but I mean, you try to talk to a CFO about HMAs, they they they, they, they forget it. Good luck, you know. They they they're just like what what what? It, this looks like a Ponzi scheme and blah blah blah. And I'm not doing that. And but actually, it's a they get a hundred times more bang for their buck than with uh, their tiny little HSA contributions that they throw in there on top of a crappy health design, a plan, health plan that's really poorly designed because. If you want to qualify for HSA, you need what I would call a, a, a health plan where you're functionally uninsured because it'll bankrupt you when you use it. So you better hope you have enough money in your HSA to pay your deductible and your maximum out of pocket that year. Um, and most people don't. That's well said. Um, Dean, Michael, you want to comment or go to, we have Dean has his hand raised. Um, I was going to quick, quick, quickly comment um, that like uh, healthcare needs a paradigm shift in which we're kind of uh incentivizing like the bottom up of solutions so it's kind of like one agree that we need um uh that's yeah like for for those who are really 
sick and needy that like, you know, maybe like, well, like HSAs have like 94% support among people um, like to actually like expand it. It's like, who would actually like use an HSA, you know? Or maybe, um, and like, well, it might, might be high, high income earners, uh, you know, it's um, then, but it's the healthcare needs to be able to create more of the, envi the in environment in it in order to allow those to test and see what actually works. You know, once we are able to have better, better costs, people can have better price trans transparency and set, set a system or be able to shop as, or be able to essentially figure out how to rig the game for them themselves and find how to get a better bargain. You know, it's what we see maybe like an increase of like, you know, 30% increase of HSAs or like 25% usage of H HMOs, um, well, no, HMAs. So it's kind of like, I, I agree that there's, there could be better competing ideas uh, between uh, which one would work to help the poor better. And I think that's exactly the conversation that, that, that needs to happen and allow the market to be able to find what's the better value for them. Um, so real quick, um, yeah. you know, Dean Jargo, um, I thought you were Dean Clancy. That's why I <laughs> asked you. Uh, Dean Clancy is an old friend and now works at AFP National. Um, so real quick, folks, the HMA that confuses CFOs, it's a novel uh, health payment uh, method that came from the top actuarial firm in the country, Milliman. And they just simply used pooling analysis and claims frequency um, uh, investigations to create a seven level uh, grid of monthly payments from consumers with increasing benefits over a 36 month schedule um, to be able to um, give you a prepaid visa for all your out of pocket. So it is the fastest growing tool among us licensed health agents. And you can contact me to learn more about uh, that uh, method. And Dean, Michael gave a nice segue. I think George did too for what you're doing uh, amongst some other friends on getting to that magical place of bundled price competition. Welcome, Dean. Yeah, thank you. Uh, two, two quick comments and then a, a question for you, Michael. Uh, first, thank you for uh, all the work you've done on this. I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find 14 people who are more impassioned about this topic and have more opinions about this topic than the 14 people you have on this call. So thanks for putting some stakes in the ground and giving us something to dialogue around. Um, and, and just one other quick comment. I think one of the things that we're all talking around is the absolute imperative for simplicity. Um, I think it's talked about too little how complex our, our health system is for the average person to navigate deductibles and co-payments and max out of pockets and HSAs and what qualifies and what doesn't qualify and in network and out of network. It's, it's more than the average person should reasonably be expected. And so I think one of the things that uh, you really should think about is how to simplify things because under the category of empowering patients, um, it's hard to empower anybody when the system is built in such a complex way that they can't even navigate it. So, you know, all this discussion about HSAs and HMAs, and they're all great tools, but if nobody knows how to use it, um, you, you know, you're going to have trouble with adoption, et cetera. And even what George was saying, C CFOs don't understand half of this stuff and they're numbers people. Um, so I think there's a big opportunity there. Um, and then, so I'll get to my question. Um, what, what is AFP's plan, strategy, timing, et cetera, for publicly messaging this, mm -hmm. this personal option proposal? Before you, you do that, Michael, Dean, uh, don't be shy. Infomercial us a bit. How are, how are you solving the price bundled problem quickly? Well, it, it, it's what you said. Uh, we're not the only ones doing it, obviously, but we're basically have built a, a marketplace. Uh, you can think of it very similar to an Airbnb. We're connecting buyers and sellers. In our case, it's uh, instead of houses, vacation homes for rent, it's, it's healthcare services. And so we bring 
uh, healthcare providers uh, mm -hmm. uh, to the market with as, as supply, and and we out we go out and talk to individual consumers and and self insured employers who are the buyers on the marketplace. And and again, it's we're we're not necessarily anti insurance. Um, we understand people need catastrophic coverage, but the reality is. We none of us need the health insurance carriers in the middle of buying and selling of healthcare services. And that's what we're trying to do is reconnect in a more direct way the true buyers and the true uh, sellers and consumers. Michael, marketing ideas? I think that's his question. Yeah, so I think I could, well, I can talk about very like top level. Um, so we're, we're looking at like, we're rolling out, out the first option, uh, doing a lot more of kind of like experimentation and kind of like testing uh, to be able to like prototype it out. Um, look at, we're looking to build uh, public support and awareness for personal option by 50% going into 2024. Uh, and then looking to be able to, during the 2024 election, uh, addressing healthcare as a top issue with a really competing alternative plan. Um, I mean, healthcare is, has stayed a top, top issue. And so um, with healthcare costs rising, it's likely to not be, a, will like betting, betting person one top three issues, if not one of the top issues. So um, yeah, we'll look at, that's kind of like the timeline we're looking at. Thank you, Murray. Well, uh, let me say Charles, your timing of this uh, uh, webinar is impeccable. I just submitted my latest manuscript on medical care to uh, Business Experts Press entitled Navigating the Medical Insurance Maze and Entrepreneur's Guide. And it should be published in the fall. It's sort of a, a how-to for entrepreneurs, giving them all the options that you and others have provided me over the past uh, several months. So anyway, getting back to uh, Michael's presentation, um, I think it was George Orwell who said, those who control the language control the debate. And uh, the debate I'd like to see, or at least the discussion I'd like to see nationally, is that uh, we should not be focusing on the term healthcare. We should be uh, focusing on the term called medical care, because that's what we pay for. And as I pointed out in my previous book that George was kind enough to hold up, um, healthcare is our responsibility as individuals. I think that's, what, that's where the self-responsibility comes in, is that optimal healthcare is in our hands uh, based upon what we do, and the point I keep on making is that uh, America is over. We're overinsured, overmedicated, and overweight. And all those three things come together in the medical sector, which is now $4 trillion a year, a mind boggling number, about 20% of GDP. So uh, I would urge Michael to, uh, to change the term from personal option to uh, putting you in control using some term of your medical care. And that's why I use the term the individual single payer system in my uh, previous book on medical care, how to have universal medical care where the individual is in charge. And I discussed that. So uh, I'd be happy to speak to you, Michael, about the strategy that I have in my book of how to literally separate medical care, uh, government from medical care and, th and, and employers from medical paying for medical care. And I think that's the, uh, that's the challenge. You know why? Because people are so entrenched in believing that the only way they're going to get inexpensive medical care is through their employer or through Medicare and Medicaid. And there are reforms that we could talk about, quote, reforms. I hate to use that term, but there are methods that are being used right now to eliminate, believe it or not, in the future, Medicaid, Medicare, and, and employer-based insurance. That, that is a huge challenge, but the research I've done reveals that we could probably reduce that $4 trillion annual medical care bill by at least half, 50%, saving $2 trillion. Could you imagine what the American people could do with $2 trillion at their disposal? What it would mean for education, housing, and other needs that people have instead of wasting money on uh, overpriced insurance? So Michael, I'd be happy to uh, continue this conversation with you. Uh, I, I could send you my email and phone that. number. And... Um, um, you know, my book's available on Amazon on universal medical care, and uh, I've done podcasts about it. But I think we have to change the debate. And yeah. uh, Nate Favini, who's a, the founder of Forward, which is a direct primary care based in San Francisco, he, he, he decided to become a doctor at age five because he saw what his father as a physician was going through in the medical field. And um, he points out, 
the, the, the current approach we have in medicine today is we have sick care, we don't have health care. And I would say that uh, what we need to do is come up with a method uh, which uh, we can work on of how do you pay for medical expenses? That's really the issue. How do you pay for medical mm -hmm. expenses, which doesn't bankrupt you? And the other thing is, uh, covers pre-existing conditions. So I think that's the that's the debate we should be having, or at least the national dialogue that would uh, that would address a lot of these issues that people are worried about. Um, yeah, I'd love to connect, uh, continue this conversation. Uh, it's almost like yeah. we should have a brain trust, Michael. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, two questions I want to get across, and then I'll uh, invite Linda to ask her question. The last question. Uh, a couple other feedback on your website. Uh, your one of your talking points on the website uh, wants quicker drug approvals. Um, I think, you know, you don't want to lose the health freedom movement that has exploded over the COVID hysteria, and I would recommend language around limiting the FDA. Um, you know, your polling will probably argue against that, but um, you know, it's not just about more, more quickly approving drugs, uh, especially given their failure to address the real epidemic in this country, which is chronic disease. And that's where integrated care comes in because at least half the country, if not more, are lying to their doctors because they, they're going to chiropractors, acupuncture, uh, doing yoga, taking, taking supplements, uh, all the things that allopath doctors are dismissing. Um, and then finally, your other talking point, liberate doctors. That gets to how you liberate doctors. And um, in my other client, National Health Federation, I'm hosting a smaller uh, we, uh, per per periodic brainstorm on reforming licensing, whether through safe harbors, exemptions, or, or competitive certifica certification. Um, so you may want to get more explicit about that talking point to bring in more healers and providers into your coalition because they have money uh, and, and they have pain. They hate the market. They've all become employees in hospitals and they hate it. So uh, John Taylor, who's on this call, a specialist surgeon could tell you, they're all wondering how to get more cash patients, but um, they're addicted to the Medicare reimbursement. Um, they don't, they don't want to uh, get booted from the approved panel of the network for the insurance companies. Um, so they're ripe. Uh, and of course, they've been mistreated during, especially the frontline doctors over the past couple of years. Um, any comments on that to rope in reform of FDA as part of your plan uh, or to be more explicit, how you liberate doctors? So, um, I mean, ultimately, it's going to be whatever we kind of can get can get through. Uh, we're really intentional about, about want to make sure that we can, can pass a, a legislation um, through uh, once we can really kind of gain broader consensus, the I know for the reforms of reforming the FDA to be able to address the advocacy components, because um, is definitely kind of where, where, where we're looking at being able to reform the FDA. Um, I think, but it's something I think it's worth of note, um, and it's because ultimately it's being able a cost for drug companies applying through the FDA, uh, you know, the cost of a billion, a billion, billion dollars, uh, like for companies to be able to do so. And while I can see like the, like, you know, I believe that people should be able to, uh, have a choice what kind of care they want to be able to receive, um, integrated, uh, I forget, how, how, how did you say it? It was integrated, integrated, you know, there's lots of different names, yeah. complementary, functional, et cetera, et cetera. Right, and so like I want to be, be able to have a comprehensive uh, market for those who want to choose the option, but for those that only trust FDA approved drugs, that they should be able to have both, both a choice and really should be on, on the, the consumer. So for those who want to choose, um, that are really just would want only FDA approved drugs, uh, it's, you know, being able to address the fact that a drug company needs to like pay a billion dollars uh, in order to get a dr drug approved onto the market you can reform the efficacy component, you start then making it more like, you know, 500, 500 million to do so. Um, and so kind of being able to, I think, um, so definitely there's a lot of like interest being able to reform the FDA. It's something we're definitely looking at, at doing. Um, I really want to hear 
and open to as many of the policy proposals we can be able to um, address with that. Okay, um, I think a, a good one would be to remove um, the efficacy requirement in FDA and just go mm -hmm. back to judging safety. Uh, and right. right now, FDA not only slows down pharma drug approvals, but it also is a puppet of pharma in targeting their competitors in the natural space. Even a Republican, Mike Brown of, of, Illinois, of Indiana, uh, just now co-sponsored, um, um, uh, what's his name from Illinois, who's always targeting supplements to require them to go through uh, pre-approval uh, before they can be marketed. Uh, which is just a simple pharma uh, play just for, for, for re-election cash. It's nothing to do with safety. There's all kinds of requirements of safety for supplements from the FDA as well as the FTC. Um, Linda, the last question. Yes. Um, I'm going to bring another um, point of view. Uh, and no, the Chinese uh, saga was uh, good doctors are the ones who prevent disease. Bad doctors are the ones who try to cure disease. And I ask my students, what type of doctors are you going to be? And they tell me, bad doctors. And one student said, yes, but if we don't have disease, we don't have a profession. And my answer was, preventive disease needs much more doctors because the clients is the entire population. Therefore, um, think about if we, if we focus on preventing like mandatory uh, every one, two or five years examination to all healthy people, all the population, then the insurance company uh, will be in the position we have to pay less insurance because preventive medicine costs less than uh, therapeutics, anesthesia, disease, surgery, and all those things. So think about preventive medicine. It's extremely important. Agreed. Yes, thank you, thank you. Absolutely, yeah. Yes. Um, definitely being able to realign these incentives in, in healthcare is super important to be able to uh, which is kind of why, like, uh, being able to change the structure of how we finance healthcare, you know, it's for millennials such as myself that we never go to to the doctor. Um, you know, instead of it feeling like I, I'm always paying out essentially out of pocket, you know, it's maybe I could be able to have more options where, um, like, an HSA or like a, an HMA, in which it incentivizes the value, in which I might choose cheaper options now to have for preventative uh, medicine or just better uh, better habits to bring better wellness to your own, own life that prevents those um, health or healthcare outcomes that come ahead in your life um, by being able to have better options and you, to realign incentives now for the consumer. So that was a little bit of a jumbled answer at the end. Thank you. But, Thank yeah. Thanks everyone. And, um, Michael, why don't you leave a final comment how folks can reach you and we'll close it up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, if you would like to put my email inside the chat, it's mwigginton at afphq.org. Love to talk with anyone. Um, please, if you ever want to check out the personal option uh, campaign, just go to our website, personaloption.com. Thank you guys for having me. I'll be a frequent guest at these meetings on, during the week. So glad to talk with everyone today. So what about your wealth? If your money could actually talk to you, would you listen to it? Well, with the DNA Network Academy, your money actually can talk to you. And it's gonna tell you just what it told this client. This family had over 24 debts, mortgages, car loans, the works. They were on track to take 20 years to pay it all off and instead did it in 8.5. Plus they did it without refinancing, making more money or even changing their lifestyle. So find out for yourself with a free analysis that is completely confidential. No personal information, no social security numbers, no credit checks, none of that nonsense. But what is exciting is that the outcome of that report you receive is a guaranteed outcome for you. To get that report, head on over to bit.ly forward slash debt to wealth. 
you will arrive at this simple form. Fill it in as simple as lender number one and credit card number two. What really matters is the accuracy of your numbers. You'll be able to see that if instead of 20 years or whatever your number is, that you may actually be out of debt and on your way to wealth in as little as 6.3 years like this client. 